I'm in 14 Hall of Fames. <laughs> Think about that, Nick. I can't run, I can't jump, I can't shoot. I got a body by lasagna, linguine, ravioli. <laughs> Yet I'm there because all my life instilled in me was about my enthusiasm. And then anything I've ever done in my life, I've always done it with passion and with pride. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. So I am here uh, with my good friend, the legendary Dickie V. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief intro, but everyone can already see you. So how's it going today, Dick? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. Uh, we uh, we got some inside baseball here. I haven't really told anyone yet, and we got a press release going out today. But So we'll let we'll let the cat out of the bag here for a second. But uh, uh, we're working on a documentary together, and I, I couldn't be more thrilled. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate you joining me on this conversation. And we're going to talk about all sorts of fun things. So I'm going to give a brief bio that I have written up, but we'll go all over the place from – coronavirus to basketball to raising money for the V Foundation. But here's a quick bio. I can't do it justice in this little time, but here you go. Dick Vitale, also known as Dickie V, is a wildly popular basketball broadcaster for ESPN who is known for his unbridled enthusiasm, charismatic delivery, and such signature phrases as diaper dandy, Rolls, Roy Rolls Royster, and awesome baby with a capital A. Dick started his career as a basketball coach who rose from the junior high level to coaching at Rutgers University and the University of Detroit before leading NBA's Detroit Pistons in a period of just nine years. He then moved on to broadcasting when ESPN was just beginning and has spent over 40 years at the cable sports network with no sign of slowing down, which I can attest to. He has been inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, as well as the National ba uh, Basketball Broadcasting Hall of Fame, sorry, the National Broadcasting Hall of Fame, and is considered basketball's greatest ambassador thanks to his devotion to the game. Dick's story is one of perseverance and determination and is filled with many surprising stories that even the most ardent of fans do not know. That's actually what surprised me the most how much there is that people don't know about you, Dick. So let's get into it, man. How's coronavirus treating you? Well, you know, coronavirus has created a nightmare for so many. Uh, my heart goes out to all those, Nick, that have lost their jobs, those that have really lost loved ones. I mean, it's been a, a nightmare. I mean, in my life, I've never seen anything like it. But you know what? You got to go on. You got to be positive as much as you can. You got to believe in what you're doing and just try to enjoy every day to the most of your ability. And I just firmly believe that if all of us, if all of us put that mask on, social distance and do the right things and listen to the science experts, the people in science, I think this thing can get under control. And let's hope and pray we get a vaccine and wipe it out so we can get back to some normalcy. Absolutely. And, and, and some basketball. So one of the things, I mean, this happened, like the shutdown happened. I actually was in Nashville, I think the day or two before it was during the SEC basketball tournament was happening. And I was like, oh man, let us just get through the tournament. And then all of a sudden it was lights out. I mean, for someone who's in the thick of that, lived your entire life in the world of basketball, college sports, have you ever seen anything even close to this? Not really, Nick. Uh, what happened with me, I was coming back from Vegas. I did a championship game uh, the beginning of March for Gonzaga was in the championship. They won. I flew home. I was going to change clothes, be home for a day, getting ready to get out with my wife and I on the plane, head to Nashville because I was going to do the semifinals and the finals out there in Nashville on ESPN. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from my boss. He said, did you get on a plane yet? I said, no, don't get on it. He said, because this tournament's not going on. And then in a short period of time later, I heard that the NCAA was not going on. But you know what? They made the right decision. You know, let's face reality, Nick. You know, I know missing sports, missing basketball is big. But the health and the safety and the, has to be the number one priority for everybody involved. I, I totally agree with that. But it was it was hard to deal with. I mean, there was there was a period of time where there was just – no sports at all. I'm excited to see college football back now. And with the, obviously the NBA bubble seems to be working. So we seem to have a, a workaround in a way, and hopefully everyone stays healthy that way. But of course we need a vaccine and everyone does need to stay safe and healthy. This is not the first adversity you have faced in your life by far. One of the stories that I was quite frankly shocked at, and, I, and most people who I speak with 
most the world knows who you are, but most of the world does not know your story, which is why I'm sure to, I'm excited to share it in, in the documentary we're working on. But I did not know you had an accident as a kid and, and you lost vision in your eye. Let's talk about that and sort of how that affected your life. Well, you know, I, I was a young kid and made a mistake and had a pencil injury to my uh, eye when I was probably, I don't remember exactly, so many years ago, four or five years of age. And it was a nightmare. My eye uh, lost the vision. And then I also had a roving eye. My eye would just rove on me. I could never look anybody straight in the eye. And I would get teased like you wouldn't believe. And I always thought it was nothing but teasing. And then when I'd go pitch in a little league, and I, I was a pretty good pitcher, Nick. I mean, I was a good athlete, basically. Not great, but I was a good athlete. And I threw fairly hard. And I'd, I'd hear parents yelling, yelling. I, I thought it was just, you know, teasing. It's way of life. You got to deal with it. But hey, does he know where he's throwing the ball? Look at his eye. Where's he going? Where's he throwing? You know, the other team. And I, at the end of the night, I would go home to my room and I'd cry like a baby. I'd stare at the, uh, the mirror, look at my eye. I could never look anybody. If I look somewhere like this, they would turn their head because my eye would go left, right, wherever. I had no control. And it just tore my heart out. I mean, it really did. And Fortunately for me, I had a great mom, great dad. I missed them so much. Uh, they were uneducated, but they had a fifth grade education, but they had a doctrine of love. And they used to, my mom used to come to the room, what's the matter, Richie, in her Italian way? What's the matter, Richie? He was never dead. And it's, I can't control my eye. I get choked up thinking about those days, Nick. They just really tore me out. And then people don't realize, and finally I did a thing about bullying a few years ago, and how people don't realize how they hurt people. And it hurt them so much. Fortunately for me, because I had such unbelievable uh, inspiration and motivation for my mom and dad and my family supporting me, I was able to get through those tough times. And I got a lucky break when I started coaching in college down there in the University of Detroit, my wife, my wife took my daughters for a typical eye test to, you know, get checked their eyes out when they were young. And the doctor, Dr. Giles, he and I talk uh, still this day. Uh, uh, he just, man, he was just a beautiful guy. He was the head of the uh, University of Michigan Eye Hospital. And uh, he just, he tells my wife, he says, your name's Vital. Are you any relation at all to Dick Vital, the coach of University of Detroit? all that jazz and now on TV. I see him on TV. I was at that time just starting out with ESPN and she said, yeah, that's my husband. She said, he said, does anybody ever told him about his eye wandering? I could fix that. I could definitely fix that. And he said, I'm a pediatric uh, eye doctor, but I would make an exception and I would do surgery on him if he would allow me. So she came home and told me that. And I was I didn't want to go any. My mother took me to so many doctors and my father when I was younger and had my problem. But I uh, eventually relented and I went there and I saw him. And he said to me, I, I can correct that eye. He said, but you got to sign these papers and I have to tell you this up front. I have to operate on your good eye to, to straighten out the eye. So I'm not pulling the muscle, et cetera, and centering them. And man, that shook me because he said to me, there's always a chance whenever you're doing eye surgery like that, there's a chance you can lose vision in, in, in the other eye. But the bottom line is I've never, ever lost vision ever in any patient I've ever operated on. Trust me. Trust me. And he says, I'll change your life. And I went home and I said to my wife, I can't do that. I can't just take that chance. And I my one eye. So anyway, the bottom line was, I'm in a studio at ESPN. This is a, I'm in a studio working on a Sunday night. And we always had a habit when we walk out of the studio after finishing, we'd say to the girl, the receptionist, any phone calls? So, you know, Nick, and then my business, if you got phone calls, it means you're, you're hitting a home run somehow. Somebody's screaming and yelling, didn't like what you said. I came out and she says, no, not really any calls except one guy. She says, and you got me so annoyed. I said, what do you mean? He kept screaming, he wants me to give him a number to our president. He wants to get you off the air. He can't stand looking at your eye. It was like a knife went right through me again, reflected back to my days in the Little League, reflected back to my, you know, my eye. Oh, my God. The one, I can control my emotion. I can control my, 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 my ability and my talent, prepare, be ready. But I couldn't control my eye. I had no control. And it just drove me nuts. So anyway, I came home. And I called up my boss, Steve Anderson. When I got into the Hall of Fame, uh, I, Steve was there. 
and, and broadcasting, and I told the story because a lot of people didn't know that story. I says, Steve knows that it came very close. If it wasn't for Steve, I probably wouldn't be here in TV today. But I called Steve up, my boss, he's vice president in charge of to talent. I said, Steve, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going back coaching. I, I can't work in TV. I'm getting mocked out my eye. I'm just, he said, come on, man. You've got to be crazy. We didn't hire you for the eye. We hired you for your ability and enthusiasm, your energy and knowledge. Don't let that guy get the best of you. Come on. So anyway, I, I, I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. Finally told my wife, I'm going back to see that doctor. And I went back to see him. I said, I'm going to take a shot. Please. I said, I don't want to lose my fish. So anyway, I went. He did the surgery. He then took me out. I was doing these thick, thick Coke bottle glasses. And he said, I'm getting out of those. Put you in a, a contact. And my life changed. It really did. The confidence he gave me. And, you know, I, I, I'm sorry getting upset, but it's just something that's with me. It's real. I, I mean, that's, that's real life right there. And I, I love... Look, first of all, I love your heart. I love your story. And, and that's why I'm excited to tell it. But most people don't know, know how big your heart is. We'll actually move into, um, I, I was going to make a mention, you, you said you're a pretty good athlete. And I just got to mention, you must have been because I met you through Rudy. And every one of your family members seems to play collegiate athletics and most of them at Notre Dame. So you have an insanely gifted athletic line of talent. So I can't even question <laughs> any of that. Um, well, I, don't know, I want to make it clear, I was not quick, I, but I, I had some good skills. I could shoot the ball, and uh, I could throw and pitch. And I mean, the biggest mistake ever happened to me is somebody told me to throw a curveball when I was 13 years old, and my arm was shot by the time I was 15. But uh, I love sports, and you know, I tried to always do the best I can. And having the one eye, I guess, was a little limitation, but I never allowed to get the best of me. You know, I never believed in camp because my parents used to always say, my mom had a saying, man, my dad too. I would hear it maybe 10, 15 times a day. It was never Dick, it was Richie. Richie, don't ever believe in camp. You could be what you want to be, even with one eye. That's nothing. She said, that's nothing for what people have. Don't let people hold you back. And she'd always say to me, and I didn't know what she meant. She said, you got so much spirit. You got so much enthusiasm, energy. Don't let people hold you back. And man, that that motivated me every day. And then I would hear in my home constantly, Nick, constantly, Richie, be good to people and people are going to be good to you. My God, have they been good to me? I'm in 14 Hall of Fames. <laughs> Think about that, Nick. I can't run. I can't jump. I can't shoot. I got a body by lasagna, linguine, ravioli. <laughs> Yet I'm there because all my life instilled in me was about my enthusiasm, and then anything I've ever done in my life, I've always done it with passion and with pride. Always gave it care and always tried to treat people the right way. And the other thing I would hear, and I only wish our nation would have it because it doesn't have it now and needs it badly, is I was always taught, treat people like you want to be treated. If we all did that, if we all treated one another like we want to be treated, we wouldn't have this hate going on. We'd have more love. And that's what we need, love. And I try to spread that constantly. I love young people. I love people. I love trying to extend the hand. I've never looked at myself at my age because I feel like a 12-year-old, man. I really do. I play singles tennis several times a week. I work out regularly. If you didn't tell me my age, I wouldn't know it until I look in the mirror and that reality sets in. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know it either. I love it. Man, we're getting so many great comments. Uh, you know, uh, my friend, Dr. Ari said, he's sorry, Dickie V. It's so true about bullying. Uh, lots of great compliments about having the courage to go through it. Oh, my heart. I love this man. I've missed hearing him. So it's so great to see people having you back and, and people, you know, my friend Richard saying, thanks so much for being real. Look, this is what the world needs. That, that's why I love, I'm addicted to telling real stories. And it's so nice to hear. Look, I got I got choked up yesterday about something. It's just about the fact of not brushing it aside, letting what comes out of you come out. Now, let's get back to your heart for a second because one of the things that you are relentless about, I'm going to say relentless in a great way, is raising money to stop children's cancer for the V Foundation. You had a, 
huge adversity this year. And we actually had a fun little story about that. Let's talk about the V Foundation, what you love about it, what you're raising money for, and how it went this year when you had to cancel your gala. Well, Nick, there's nothing that possesses me more than raising money to help kids battling cancer. We've been doing it for 15 years now. We started out with a little event at my house, and then it spread to become big time to we sell out almost every year. We do. We sell it every year at the Ritz-Carlton in Sarasota, over 900 people, 1,000 a person, and we have the donations, and people contribute at the event, and auction items, et cetera. And we've raised so far since I started 37 million. This year, as you said, we were hit with a real challenge because of the pandemic and we had to go virtually. But through the support of people out there, like, I mean, Mark Pentecost, the Pentecost people, CEO of It Works. I mean, he challenged me. In fact, I was doing the interview with you when uh, he challenged me about 20 minutes before I got out with you. And he said to me, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you can match it. And I watched you to match it within a week or so. And I started telling you, I said, I don't know where I'm going to go. And you said, well, call a couple of my friends up, like Mark Cuban, Peyton Manning, all these guys. So I don't really know them. But I know of them, and they know of me most likely. But maybe do a little video. And I did a little video for Mark Cuban. Hi, Mark, Dick Vitale. I know you get hit up many, many times when people want money, but I'm going to tell you about our cause. And I told them all about, you know, helping kids and how we need these dollars, et cetera. And within like a short period of time, you called and said, hey, go to your wife's email address because I don't do email. Go to her email address and look what's there. And I couldn't believe it. I, mean, I don't know exact words. It was like a sentence. Hey, Dickie V, are you kidding me? Something like that. You count me for 500K. Well, man, did that get me motivated. And within seven hours, we raised the million dollars. And then Mr. Pentecost came back and said, look, you got a pandemic to deal with. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I don't like giving money unless other people contribute as well. He said, I love what you're doing. I love your cause. I've been to your gala. It's about kids. And he said, I feel blessed in my life. I want to help. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you another million if you go out and raise two million by the time you're a virtual gala. Well, Nick, I was on that roller decks and I called friends up to give me new names and I'm calling and calling and calling. And we finished with $7.4 million for kids battling cancer. And it's so needed. I mean, a month ago, I get a phone call from a dad. I get to know the family really well. Jared Herman. It's a great, great story. Uh, it, it's an amazing story. If I get a moment to share it. Uh, do I have a moment to share this? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, here's the story. My wife and I one day are having dinner at the Capitol Grill. And as we're having dinner, this family comes over. A, a, well, husband and wife, a young couple, very, very just, just classy. They came over and they thanking me and really can say, hey, geez, it's such a great thing you're doing, raising money for kids. We, it affects our family. My son had brain cancer. So really keep doing what you're doing. There's something about them I liked. So I said, join my wife and I. So they joined us. And as we're sitting there after about an hour talking, he whips out an iPhone. And he said, I got to show you my little son. And he shows me a video. He was 10 years old at the time. Uh, Weston now is 13. He was 10 and a half. I couldn't believe what I was watching. This kid playing hockey against these older kids scoring at will. I mean, I thought, what happened? This is unbelievable. So then the end of the night, I get in the car, driving back home, and I said to my wife, call my buddy up, who, by the way, called me last night, FaceTime, just flew back from Edmonton, winning the Stanley Cup, John Cooper of the Lightning. So I called John up. Because John and I do events out in Tampa to raise money for kids battling cancer. He goes to my gala, to the V Foundation, but he does a thing called Coop's Catch, all about fishing with the star players, going out, and people really respond. And John is a beautiful guy. So anyway, I called John up. I said, John, John, you got to do me a favor. I just met this kid, his family. He's got brain cancer. I need a jersey with his name on it. Lightning jersey with number one, and John being the great guy is come on, Dick. I can do better than that. Why don't you have his father and bring him up and skate with the team? <laughs> skate with the team. I said, Are you serious? So when I told the father, they went nuts, they went out, they skated, and they became very close with him. Well, anyway, he called me about I don't know, a month or two ago, and he says to me, I could hear his voice, he knew it was in pain. He said, Dick. Got bad news, man, bad news. We go for our quarterly scan to see, you know, 
cancer is totally in remission, etc. He had three battles of brain cancer, two brain surgeries, and he said they said now it's come back again. And he's going to have the fourth battle. And man, I'm getting choked up. He's a beautiful kid. If you saw him, I, I took him with me to a baseball game, introduced him to Derek Jeter and all that, and took him and a couple of cancer kids. The Rays were good enough to give us their presidential box and suite, and we had a great time. The kids got jerseys and balls. So anyway, just a great kid. So he says to me, they give us two options. One, if they do surgery again, it could be very dangerous because they've done two operations in his brain. And there's always a danger of paralysis. And the second option is 52 more weeks of chemotherapy. Oh, my God. I said, can't believe that. To make a long story short now, this is amazing. It happened about, I guess, three weeks, four weeks ago. He does his chemo. He does his chemo. And after he finishes his chemo, Nick, he says to the doctor, I'm going to play hockey tonight with my team. Oh, he's 13. He's playing. So he can't play hockey. He just did chemo. He went out, scored three goals, two assists. They said it was an article in the paper about it. And I have my text messages constantly trying to raise money. I send to all these different people I know. And I have some celebrities on there. And one was Bill Belichick. So I sent to Belichick and I sent the article about this kid. And he sent back a text message. You talk about courage. You talk about special kids. Well, you know, I get to know these kids. You know, Nick, I've been speaking for over 30 years across this nation, black tie events, corporate events, motivational seminars, banquets, Apple, you name them. The toughest speeches I ever had to give in my life, I was asked to speak at a couple of funerals. And I'm going to tell you something, nothing worse than a mom and dad. In fact, as we're talking, now, Nick, and all you people that are listening, if you think you have a tough day today, maybe things aren't going well with you and your stock market, or maybe something didn't go well in, in, in travel or whatever, think about this. 45 to 50 mothers and fathers today, today and every day, every day, are hearing four words that no mom and dad ever, ever wants to hear. Your child has cancer. It's life changing. And I will work. I told a youngster by the name of Tony Colton. In fact, I can show you a picture. These kids here, if you can see this here, this is a flyer of all these kids that have either been at my gala or their family's been at my gala who are no longer with us. They lost their lives in the battle against cancer. And I will never let them be forgotten, ever, ever. I will raise dollars to try to help other kids so they don't make it to this page. We don't want anybody on this page. The bottom line is so special, but the one youngster there, you see his name, Tony Colton. Tony, for six years, battled left and right, in remission, not in remission. Finally, near the end, he came to my gala about two years ago. He did a gala, and he was really in trouble at that time. And then he came to my house the next day when all the celebrities gather at my house for a party and all the big donors, et cetera. And he asked me, he said, can I speak to them? I said, show Tony, he's 16 years old. I said, you sure want to do that? He said, I want to speak. So he gets up and he says, hey, man, please listen to Mr. V. Please help. Help us so all the kids don't go through what I'm going through. It's really, it's, it's horrible what it does to your family, to me. Well, a couple months later, I get a phone call that he's at Old Children's Hospital, that it was taken here. I go to the hospital. We walk in his room. He's hooked up with every tubes, et cetera. He can barely, this kid had an unbelievable personality. He was just going to be a senior at the time. And here he's in high school, and loved by all his classmates, teachers. And Tony's laying there, and he calls me to the bedside with his finger at the moment. And you can barely hear him talk, Nick. I will never forget as long as I live. He says to me, keep doing, keep doing, keep doing what you're doing, please. And I said to him, so Tony, I'll tell you this now. To my last breath, I don't care. I'm going to beg. I'm going to plead. I'm going to get rejected, obviously, by some. But I'm going to keep begging and pleading to raise dollars to help kids. And 
I listen and I think about him every moment. Whenever I think of raising dollars, I see him laying in that bed. He passed a, a short period of time later. My wife and I went to the wake and just, just tears you up. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing a mom and dad put a child to rest. I mean, I could go on with this. I don't want to bore you. But bottom line is it does affect me and it does affect me. I'm committed to helping these kids because I promise. And when I give my word to do something, I'm going to do it. Uh, and you and do it. You do very well. I get. I'm on those text messages, and you uh, you relentlessly with heart just share and share and share and share, and you raise a ton of money. I have huge admiration for it. I actually was able to find, by the way, um, I had to strip it for a second. But I was actually able to find. Uh, I'm going to share it here on the screen. The the Mark Cuban email, and it said, "Here's what Mark said: You don't mess around, DV. I'll put up." 500k one of the best emails i've ever gotten which which ended up being a million dollars in return and, and you know what here's the thing it, it, yes people can say oh that's mark cuban it is but all you and i did was conspire for good together to try to figure out how can we make this happen who do i know who i just started thinking who do i know who has money and loves basketball and would care and i gotta say uh mark cuban I don't know Mark well. I've done a few things with him, but I mean, that email right there shows incredible heart. And he is, uh, I, I would argue to anyone what a good man he is just even from that one interaction. By the way, he had a similar, um, there's sort of a parallel story we can draw. There's an article I saw the other day where Mark went out and found a former player from the Mavericks who is having a, a hard time with drugs and put him in a home and said, I will pay for rehab. So Mark Cuban is, is batting high on my list right now. Dick, you had a player back in the day that, was an incredible player that you just couldn't get to settle in and sort of got involved with the rough with the wrong crowd. Tell us a little bit, I guess, first of all, we'll get, let's get to there in a second, but how you got involved in coaching, first of all, like how did you even get to be a high school and then college and then be a coach? Well, you know, first of all, I was coaching, uh, uh, I always loved sports. I was coaching a baseball team and the baseball team during the summer, kids between the ages of 16 and 18, and I got the best, I went out and recruited the best high school players in our area. And they had this team and it really was outstanding, really outstanding. I mean, anybody could have managed them, not me, but they were that good. And we won the state championship, all that. But coming into games was an administrator from the uh, Garfield Public Schools. And he came up to me one day and he says to me, I was working at the time in accounting. My degree was in business. And I was working in accounting and I'm sitting in that office and I was bored out of my mind. Didn't like what I was doing. But, you know, it was a job after graduating from Seton Hall. And uh, that was my career. I kept looking at the people around me, looking at the clock all the time, five o'clock, doing their trial balances, leaving. I'm saying, I'm going to do this all my life. I, don't know. I can't. I mean, I, I didn't enjoy it, but I loved coaching. So he said to me, how would you like to teach? I said, well, I can't teach. I have no certification. See, you can. I can get you a job. You get a provisional certificate. You go back and take your certification while you're teaching at night. And I'd love to hire you and have you work uh, in coaching as well. You can coach the elementary school, you know, junior high, basketball, baseball, football. I can tell you this. I coached football two years. I don't know nothing about the split tee, the wing tee. I don't know anything about that at all. I remember my first meeting with the team telling the players, I hey, man, I know nothing about all that. So I didn't play football. But I know one thing. If they get six, I look at the scoreboard, we better get seven. And somehow, some way, we didn't lose a game for two years. And then I coached basketball there and I coached baseball. But the bottom line is I decided if you want to get ahead, I couldn't get ahead in football because I didn't have the background in play. And you look at all the coaches, they're all former players, uh, guys who really uh, uh, know the game. And I didn't even play high school football because I couldn't. The doctors wouldn't let me because of my eye. So anyway, I, I said, you know what? But basketball, you can get there if you have hard work, you go to clinics, you learn the game inside out. And I did that. I kept going to clinics, learning the game. And I coached. And then one day the phone rang. It was my former principal in high school who became the superintendent of schools at East Rutherford, New Jersey. And he called me up and said, Richie, Richie. He said, we want to bring you back to East Rutherford. I mean, I'm 20 at the time. I was probably 23 or 24 years old. So I want to bring you back here. We're going to make you the head coach of the high school. I said, really? Head coach of the high school? Wow. Yeah, we heard great things you're doing out there in Garfield. We've got to get you where you belong, your alma mater. He said, but I have to be honest with you. Nobody wants the job. 
He goes, we got a 60 by 40 gym that we practice in, play all basically games on the road, most of them, and eventually we played them all on the road, but we got a little bit more uh, experience and we became pretty good. So the bottom line is, I said, are you kidding me? I don't care if we practice outside, I'm coming. And I took the job in the first year, we took a, it's a football school, East Rutherford High School, East Rutherford, New Jersey, the Wildcats. I was just the other one of my players on my text message the other day. Uh, bottom line is we went out, won the state sectional championship my first year. My last two years, we won the state championships, went undefeated, won like 35-0, and 0, something like that. And we had a great player. When I met this great player, his name was Leslie. Leslie was a seventh grader, eighth grader, and tall, big, never really played the game. So I went and I worked with him and worked with him every day. I would work with him, his left hand, his right hand. And when he became a ninth grader, a star, he became a star. And I mean a star, dominated. Probably, I think he might be still the leading scorer in the history of Bergen County in New Jersey and led us to state championships. But along the way, his junior year got a little carried up with all the publicity and notoriety. I sort of lost that relationship that I had with him in terms of him not listening. And one time it was like a son to me. And bottom line is he kept listening to the wrong people. And I took him to my office a number of times and I told him, I said, up and down, I said, you, you're messing your life up. You're messing your life. I mean, you know what you're doing. He kept denying. They all deny it. No, no, no. I'm not doing this. You don't trust me. Don't trust me. Well, bottom line is he then one day accused me of, his friends were filling his heads up with they a lot of racial problems at the time. He was an African-American kid and, and people came around out of nowhere, all of a sudden filling his head up with, your coach is using you, man. He's just using you to get a college job. He don't care about you. And he had the nerve. He tells me that one day and I went off. I said, where were those people when you were in the seventh and eighth grade? Where were those people in the hours I put in with you? I want you to understand something right now. I said, Leslie, I'm going to forget to tell him. Eye to eye, man. We were looking eye to eye. I had to look up and I'm looking eye to eye. You know, I'm up to here with it. To be honest with you, I'm fed up with all the teachers complaining about you, about class. You, you change. And not anywhere the kid that you were. And you're heading down the wrong road. And those people don't care about you. And that's a problem out there. Some of them listen to those people, some don't. Making good decisions in life, as I always say, life can be simple. You make good decisions, good things happen. Make bad decisions. Bad things happen. I said, Leslie, I love you, man. I want nothing but the best. There's nobody wants you to do better than I do, except maybe your mom, your stepdad. But the bottom line is if you do well, I look good too. But right now you're embarrassing me. Every day I'm getting close to teachers. You're cutting close. It is. There's no way in the world that I'm going in any package deal as they're suggesting with you to college, okay? And I'm gonna understand something else. I'm gonna get a job someday because I'm gonna keep working and working and working and doing things the right way. Somebody's gonna give me an opportunity. I said, trust me. Well, I went on, got the Rutgers job. He went on, we couldn't get him in a four year school. He went to a junior college. His grades were so bad. And then he ultimately, ultimately just got involved big time with drugs. And they had an article, I will never forget this, 1996. I'm in my hotel room and one of my former players calls me up and says, see the back page, the back page of the Daily News in New York. I was in New York, New Jersey, because we were doing uh, work from the Final Four from the Meadowlands. And the Meadowlands is in East Rutherford, New Jersey. So this writer, Ian O'Connor, who now works at ESPN, was a columnist, was a columnist in the Daily News. And his whole article was going to be about, here's East Rutherford, here's Dickie V, who coached here in the city, high school, won state championships, on top of the world, and here's his superstar that helped make this happen for him. And he has pictures of him in the Bowery in New York. You, if you get if you Google that article, Ian O'Connor, and you put down less case on Dick Vita, I think, still think you can get it. But the article, he says, what do you see this article? And the article comes out basically that Ian goes there to talk to Leslie. He's been arrested. He talks to the cops numerous times. I mean, what he looked like, I could not believe. Just that the kid that I 
knew as a young kid and just tore my heart out. And, and it enlisted a, a priest in the Bowery who helps these the young people having problems. So anyway, to make a long story short, he says in the article, he tells Ian O'Connor, it's in the article, he says, hey, whatever you do, don't blame my coach. I'm happy my coach is doing so well. I didn't listen to my coach. He begged him, basically saying, you know, the fact that, man, I'm paraphrasing those, basically said that, you know, I wish he would have listened to me and a whole bit, and it just tore my heart out. So I called up that priest, and I said to him, I'm going to send you a couple of thousand dollars. Don't you dare to give it to him personally, but for anything he needs, you needs toothpaste, toothbrush, shirt, pants, please help him. Please help him. Well, the priest called and told him he was going to do that. And unless he won't be a letter, once again, I don't trust him. He writes, I scribbles a letter. You don't trust me. Why don't you give me the money? I'm the one that needs another priest. You know? And, you know, I just, and then short period of time after that, he passed at such a young age, overdosed the drugs. Like, well, actually AIDS. I think he ended up dying. For my, uh, I paid for the funeral. I paid. I told my, my former players. I'm not going to the funeral. I was living in Florida. At times I won't go because, most of all, I want to remember him when he was a young kid doing the right thing. But number two, he violated everything I ever believed in and everything I preached with him. I said, but I will pay for the funeral and I will take care of it, the whole thing. And you know, it's sad in a way. It's probably my biggest failure in life. Because this kid, he was Kevin Durant before Durant. I'm telling you, man, 6'10", shoot the jump shot, drive with the basketball inside, outside. And it just really, it was crushing. It's one of those things in life. Uh, I praise up in heaven now and hope to rest in peace. That's just a sad, sad part of my uh, coaching career. Uh, but it also shows your heart and what you really care about. And, and at the end of the day, developing kids, which is part of what you do even now in college basketball. Um, I can't wait. So everyone, if you missed the beginning, we are doing a documentary together. So we're going to share the whole story. We can't share it all now or you won't watch the documentary. So we are going to do that. Uh, an honor to tell your story. And then also just, uh, Dick, if you tell them where, if they want to donate after they hear your stories about the V Foundation, where can they go uh, to donate to the V Foundation? Well, right now, I hope that they do this. They go out there and get my new book. My new book is called The Lost Season. And it's all about what could have been and should have been if we had March Madness last year. And it's doing really well. They're getting good reviews. And all the money is going to go to benefit young people. All out there. Remember I told you earlier, these kids all died of cancer. But we're going to help kids out there who are battling disease. Because every dollar, not 60 cents, 70 cents, every dollar from the sale of the book is going for pediatric cancer to the V Foundation, which is a great, great charity, great organization. Gets the highest rated you can get from Charity Navigator. Every dollar, not like some uh, organizations where half of the money goes to people that work in the offices the whole bit. We have a deal with an unbelievable, uh, we have a, an endowment over $37 million and off that endowment, uh, all the administrative costs are paid. So all you can do, if you want an autograph copy, I personally sign it any way you want me to sign it. I write what you want. You just go to dickvital.com. And if you don't want the book, you still can make donations there. But you can also, when you go to dickvital.com, and every dollar I would get from this all goes to kids. I have basketballs with my name, PT Piers on them. We have mini balls. We have hats, designer hats, Nicky V. And they're not expensive. The book's $29.99. And I'll tell you one thing, Nick. A lot of people out there have bought at least 25 books and for giving them away as gifts to customers, clients, people. And if they do that, it's $20 per book. I autograph them. They give me a list of names. I autograph them. They give them out. And again, they help also along the way in making a donation because the money, like I said, goes to the V Foundation for kids. So people, please go to dickvital.com. DickVital.com. Nick, great talk to you, man. I can't wait to see what you're doing here. Um, Jay, really, I, you got me emotional today, buddy. I didn't know I was going to get emotional. But you know what? It's been awesome, baby. Great therapy for me, I guess. Uh, I really enjoy it, buddy. Thanks, man. We, I will talk with you soon. And uh, good luck on your, your next meeting. And we'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on Now to Next. We'll see you next Nick, time. Nick, he's awesome, baby, with a capital A. 
Hey, Nick Nathan here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.